Well, church, it's great to be with you again today. I'm excited about the Word of God. I'm excited about what God is saying to His people. And I'm even more excited about our supplying the Word and see God begin to move in a new season that I believe is upon the church right now. Look, uh, this morning we're going to carry on with the uh, five prophetic shifts that I shared about three weeks ago. And over the next few months, we're going to break down these shifts because this is what I believe is that when God begins to speak to the church, we need to have a heart and we need to understand what God is saying and how we can begin to put it into practice for our lives. You know, God's word is very valuable. The prophetic word, knowing what is on God's heart at this time and in this season is absolutely vital for us to track that and to begin to break it down to see what God is requiring of us today. So we, we are going to delve in and dive right into the Word of God. We're going to look this morning at uh, the first shift that I explained and talked about three weeks ago, the shift from being distant from God towards being near to Him, experiencing intimacy with God in a new way. You know, we uh, looked at the Word of God where Jesus Christ found himself at the temple as he went to attend to pray there on the Temple Mount. And as he approached, he could see that there were some major issues going on right there and then. There were merchants that were buying and selling goods. There were money changes that were available to be able to do business in the house of God. And I want to turn our attention there today uh, because I believe that this is a major set of scripture where this adjustment, this reset, this realignment that God is talking about. You know, when our bones are out of joint, we, we become disjointed. And we've got to have a reset take place where we get put back into the right alignment. And this passage, I believe, is speaking about the need for that alignment to happen. So we're going to turn to John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now, this account was present in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in Matthew's Gospel, the same account, it's written about Jesus' words. He said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Those who were at the temple were using their um, ability to make money, to trade, uh, goods and services, and it had a, created a major barrier for people to come and experience the intimacy of God at the place that Jesus said God's intention was always that his house would be called a house of prayer. But they changed it and they'd made it into something else. And he said that they were thieves that made it into a den of thieves. So these people had created a barrier between God and his people. And that's what I want to talk about today, this shift of being distant from God and drawing near to God and experiencing the intimacy of God will only happen when we're able to identify as Jesus had done, these merchants, these money changers had become a barrier for God's people to experience the presence and the power of God in the place of prayer. You know, Jesus uh, states in his original intention that this house was always to be a house of prayer, a house of connection to the Father, a house of intimacy with God. It's supposed to be a house where they could draw near to God and experience God drawing near to them. But instead, they were being robbed of relationship with Jesus. Nowhere else do we see the anger and the wrath of Jesus 
other than in this account of literally making a whip of cords, a handmade whip, which he used to chase these merchants and money changers out of the temple courts. And so we can see that God's people here were being lied to and they were being stolen from because of this barrier that had been erected right at the entranceway where they were to go and experience God in the house of prayer today. How did Jesus feel about this? Well, we see he's angry, he's upset, he's demonstrative in how he handled the situation. And I believe that that's how Jesus is right now. I believe that's what he is experiencing in his heart with the many barriers, the many lies that God's people have been told by the enemy and the father of lies, Satan himself. These barriers are stopping and hindering God's people from drawing near to the Lord and uh, to experience closeness with Him, to experience intimacy with God, to experience what God always intended, a close, intimate relationship with the Father because of what Jesus has made available to us. I want to talk this morning about three common lies of the enemy And how these lies can become barriers to us to experience intimacy with the Father. And the first lie that I want to talk about today is simply this. Number one is serving God is all about what I can do for God. We buy into this and before we know it, our lives are frantic activity of busyness and supposed productivity for the kingdom of God, rushing here, rushing there. Uh, You know, I believe right now the world has a sickness. It's called hurry sickness. We're always about the next thing, the next thing, the next thing that we can do for God. And we're so busy serving God that we've actually forgotten what it means to be with God. And so as we come across this lie, you know, we can see that there's an account in Scripture that perfectly illustrates this. Not only is it a perfect illustration, but it's Jesus himself in the middle of this story, that, that this account that took place with uh, two sisters and a brother, Mary, Martha and Lazarus, that Jesus used to often visit. And he would go and he would stay with them at their house. And this account that we're about to read is Jesus himself going to visit uh, this family and going inside the doors of their home where he would experience their hospitality. We find the story in Luke 10, beginning at verse 38. Now it happened as they went and entered a certain village, a certain woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Verse 41. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. You and I, if we've been Christians for a while, we've probably seen this scene and this scenario played out many times, meeting in homes, meeting at church where there's a meal being put on, and it seems that there's a certain few that are busy in the kitchen running around preparing the meal for everybody else while everybody else is sitting around fellowshipping, talking about the Lord, uh, experiencing the closeness of the body of Christ to one another. And so this is a common scenario that we see. But what I find interesting here is that the word in John talks about specifically that Jesus tells Martha that she is worried and distracted with many things. And it's interesting, the word distracted means having one's thoughts or attentions drawn away, unable to concentrate or give attention to something. Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. We're often faced as believers, as followers of Jesus with two choices. The choice to get distracted and be drawn away from keeping the main thing the main thing 
or actually being focused, being on target and keeping that personal, intimate relationship at the front and center of our lives. And we see this story is so well illustrated by Martha, who's got distracted, who has moved away from that, which is the most important thing in all of our lives, which is not our activity, our our busyness of our lives serving God, but keeping front and center what Mary did, sitting at the feet of Jesus and being able to rest in the presence of God, to be refilled, rejuvenated, to receive the touch of God, the presence of God upon her life. Something that Jesus says himself is the one thing that is needed in all of our lives. And she chose that good part, which will never be taken away from her. You see, relationship with God will never be taken away from us. As we build relationship, it can't be robbed from us. We've banked it. We've put it in the bank. We've invested. Every time we draw near to God, we've made an investment in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Sitting at the feet of Jesus is never wasted time. You know, we've sold the lie, the lie that, you know, we should be out being busy, being productive, doing works of service for God. And I believe in works of service. In fact, Ephesians 2.10 says that there are good works prepared in advance for every believer to do, but not at the expense of my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When we settle for knowing about him rather than knowing him, we're being robbed of a relationship with God. And God has a desire in his heart for all of us to draw us away to a place where we can spend undistracted time with him and allow his presence to touch over our lives. You know, when we invest that time with God, this is what takes place with us, is that an ordinary moment and an ordinary day through one touch of the Father, one touch of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we spend time with God can absolutely turn an ordinary day into an extraordinary moment in our lives. I've found over the years in my life where I've struggled with certain issues and as I've spent that time drawing near to the Lord, one touch, one touch of the Master and I find that my life can be completely changed in that one touch moment that I have with God. And my ordinary day has just changed into a supernatural, extraordinary day as I've banked and invested and made time to draw near to God, to experience an intimate moment with him where he's touched something deeply in my heart. You know, sometimes years and years of counseling, not not that I don't believe in counseling, I totally believe it. You know, his name is Counselor. He should be called Wonderful Counselor. We know that counseling and advice and wisdom from God is vital, but nothing can take the place of experiencing a one-touch moment through intimacy with Jesus that can radically change the course of our life. I believe that the human heart has been designed to become a dwelling place of God. Man is the dwelling place of God. And that one moment can cause revelation to stick in our hearts forever and ever for the rest of the time that we're called to walk planet Earth today. And so as we just recap this barrier, you know, this barrier to intimacy that says, you know, serving God is all about, is all about me having an agenda of what I must do for God. It's about do, do, do and running around, chasing my tail, trying to do stuff for God in order to please him. And we've been sold the lie, motion and movement equals ministry. Always on the move, always in motion with our lives and never taking time like Mary did to stop and sit at the feet of Jesus. We're so busy doing things for God that we've failed to experience a relationship with God. And we wonder why our souls become so void of the life of God. We we wonder sometimes why we're experiencing such a dryness in our spirit. It's because we've bought into the lie. And this lie of doing, doing, doing has created a barrier for us to draw near to him and experience the closeness of God. The second thing I want to talk about today, the second barrier, is the lie that we've been sold. I'm not good enough to have 
an experience, a close moment with God. You know, it's this lie that's destroyed many a uh, relationship, many a family moment uh, as children have experienced, as young men have experienced a moment of displeasure or disappointment from their fathers. And as a result of that, they've experienced that wedge of disappointment. I'm not good enough for you, Dad. I'm not good enough for this family. I'll never be good enough for you. And then after that only comes estrangement where they are separated as father and son or da- daughters with their dads. You know, in our teen years, there's many incidences that often take place that can cause separation for years and years afterwards as we experience the brunt of our parents' displeasure and the disappointment of that. And we and sitting in our spirit from that day on is this lie that's in there. I'll never be good enough. When can I ever be good enough to make someone else happy? And this sits over us, you know, and it's a subtle lie. I tell you why it's so subtle. It's subtle because of this, is that is that we know that the truth is that Isaiah said, there's none good, no, not one. All have gone like sheep, have gone astray. We know that Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that we know in ourselves that sin has marred our lives, that it has caused separation with God. But I want to tell you something today. Why would God go to all the effort of releasing his son from the heavens of heavens to come and be born of a Virgin Mary, to grow up and demonstrate what the Father is like, to grow up and demonstrate God in the flesh, and then to actually pay the penalty for man's sin by suffering excruciating torment and a crucifixion, uh, a cruel method of dying under Roman rule and occupation. And Jesus did all of that Why? He did it because he thinks you're worth it. He thinks I'm worth it. There is worth to every human being. There is worth, there is value, there is something that God is chasing after in your life. He loves you to the degree that he would go to such an extent to have a rescue operation and plan to rescue you and I uh, from that horrible thing that we've all experienced in our lives, that, that thing that sinks in our spirit that says, I'm not good enough. You know, it's a, this, this is a barrier that will keep you from approaching God. This is a barrier that will make you feel unclean, unworthy, that you can't approach God. Why would he listen to someone like you who's who's dirty and unclean and not fit for a holy God? I want to tell you, this is a perversion of the gospel. The word gospel means good news. What's the good news? The good news is this, is that we have all fallen, that we have all fallen short of the mark that God set for us, but God didn't leave us in that place. Love by the grace of God. Grace means unmerited favor and kindness that we could never earn being granted to us. Mercy means that we don't get what we deserve through grace and mercy. God reached out through his son, Jesus, because he didn't want to leave us in that state. He didn't want to leave us in that condition of not knowing and not experiencing the love of Father God within our lives. And, you know, the disappointment that many of us have felt and that ongoing record player, that ongoing recording in our mind, I'll never be good enough, I'll never be good enough. This often keeps many uh, great servants of God from experiencing a closeness and an intimacy with God. I want to tell you today that Jesus Christ not only loves you, he's madly in love with you today. You know, um, we can bank on God's grace no matter what. You know, the Bible says, though I fall, though I fall, I will not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds me with his mighty hand. And there's a great story in the Bible of a father who had two sons. The older brother was faithful, stayed at home with his dad on the farm. The younger one was a rascal, a rebel. He wanted the fast life. He asks his dad for his inheritance before he dies. He takes all the money. He runs to a far country. He wasted on on prodigal living and he spends everything and he comes to the end of himself feeding a, a herd of pigs in a pig pen where he even begins to desire the very food that he's feeding these pigs and he has a moment at the rock bottom part of his life 
where he realizes that even the paid servants in his father's house are experiencing a way better life than him. So he makes his mind that he's going to go back to his father and he's going to ask for grace. He's going to ask for mercy that he would God that his father would give him another opportunity. So he heads back. His father's waiting for him. He embraces him. You see, Jesus was telling in the story a picture of what the father's heart is like for each one of us. Oh, my friends, we could not get it more wrong saying I'm not good enough to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. God has made a way for us to experience the eternal, everlasting love of the Father. He put a ring on his finger, sandals on his bare feet. He robed him with a beautiful garment, and then he killed the fatted calf and had a party for his son who was lost and now is found. That's how God feels about us when we return to him. He's there waiting with open arms to receive us back into his heart. God so desires that intimacy with us. And I want to tell you, God can break this off your life, this mindset, this spirit that tells you that you are not good enough, that's stopping you from drawing near to God because you think he doesn't want to hear from you anyway. Nothing could be further from the truth, friend. Like the, this prodigal lost son who returned, the father was there to love on him, lavish on him. You know, the surprise in this story is the attitude of the older brother. And I believe this is a picture of somebody who's never been healed of that, that, uh, that drop in his spirit that says, I'm not good enough. This boy, the older brother, had stayed with his father all those years. And through all those years, he served him faithfully. But you know what? He never had intimate relationship with him. Because when the father lavished attention on the lost rascal rebel son, he got angry and he got mad. And sometimes some of us think, yeah, that seems unfair. That doesn't seem right. He was a good boy all those years. But you see, even though he was in his father's house, he never experienced intimacy and closeness with his father. He complains to his father. He says, I've been with you all these years. You've never killed the fatted calf for me. You've never thrown a party for me. And you know what? In Luke 15, it says this. It says, uh, this is the father's response. And these are Jesus' words in verse 31 of Luke 15. The father said to the older brother, son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. What a tragedy. He'd been in his father's house all those years, but he never felt that he could access all that the father had for him. Because he, even though he was present, he wasn't intimate in close relationship with his father. And his father is saying, all this time, son, you could have asked me at any time. And I would have loved to have thrown you a party just like I have for the younger son. So to finish this point off, I want to say to your church simply this. The blood of Jesus speaks on your behalf today. You no longer need to stand out on the outer court. You no longer need to stay in the shadows. Today you can come out of the shadows and come into the light where the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. And you can be healed of that mindset. You can be healed of that demonic spirit that's always plaguing you that says you're never going to be good enough. And you can break that barrier in your life and suddenly realize that you've been made good enough through the blood of Jesus to experience the closeness of your father. And this final barrier, I want to talk about this barrier to developing intimacy and this barrier to drawing near to God and seeing him draw near to you. Number three is the pursuit of things will bring your soul satisfaction. This is the lie that is sold worldwide over. This is the lie that the marketers love to trumpet. This is the lie that much business buying and selling of goods has done around. We've grown up with this lie all of our life. And so we believe that if only we had that nice Corvette, if only if we had that late model car, if only we had that shiny uh, new house, if only we, we got a better house than what we have now and we begin to cover what other people have. Friends, I want to tell you today, this is a lie from the pit because you know what happens? You can upgrade to that latest model car. You can get that better house than what you've got before. And within a few weeks, you will experience 
dissatisfaction. You'll no longer be content because the truth of the matter is the pursuit of things will never bring your heart the true satisfaction that only God can bring, that only a close relationship with Jesus can bring. This is one of the first deceptions that Satan used when he deceived Adam and Eve, where he says to them, he comes and slithers into the garden as the serpent and says, did God really say that you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden? And he made it appealing to them. He made that which that which God said you can't have. He made it so appealing that they transgressed and they agreed together to partake of the fruit that was on that tree. And as a result of that, my brothers and sisters, as they partook of that, what tasted nice, what was desirable to the eyes and pleasurable uh, to the mouth became a bitter, bitter part of their lives. As at that moment, their, their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked and they experienced shame. They experienced guilt for the first time. You see, the pursuit of things will never, ever satisfy us. And we can be allured through the eye gate. We can be allured through the five senses. We can, we can think that this next thing, if we just pursue it and we get a hold of it, that it's going to bring us the satisfaction that we deserve. Friends, the only thing that can bring your soul the true satisfaction is the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle, which is Jesus Christ front and center in your life. You know, Jesus himself, he said this to the woman at the well in John 4, the woman of Samaria. He said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that as you realize today that you can break down these barriers, that you can break down this thing in your life that says you've got to reach for that elusive thing that will bring you satisfaction. As you begin to divert your focus away from that, and begin to place Jesus front and center within your life, you will begin to experience a soul satisfaction that is so deep. In fact, Paul says it like this in Philippians. You will begin to experience a peace that is so deep that surpasses all human understanding, and it will keep your heart and your mind. It will cause healing in your life. As you begin to draw near and wait in the presence of Jesus, as you begin to experience the whisper of his voice saying, this is the way, walk you in it. As you begin to experience the satisfaction and pleasure of the presence of God washing over you, renewing you daily. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, Isaiah says. As you begin to experience these things that come as a byproduct of drawing near to God and experiencing intimacy with Him, you will begin to realize that all those things that you may have been pursuing, they're hollow, they're empty, and they'll never bring your soul true satisfaction. So as I finish this message today, I want to remind you again of our opening passage where Jesus drives out the merchants and the money changers with a handmade whip. And He says, take these things away. What is he saying to you today, my brother and sister? What is he saying to you that you need to take away? What are these barriers that have been stopping you from experiencing a deeper level of relationship with Jesus Christ? Because right now there is a shift. There is a call globally to the body of Christ to stop being so distant from your maker, to stop being so far away from the one who longs, loves you and yearns for a relationship with you. It's time now to draw near to God and experience His love washing you, cleansing you, moving in and through your heart, experiencing a makeover from the inside, from the up, up from the top to the bottom of your top of your head to the soles of your feet, experiencing inner transformation because you've found 
a way to break through these barriers, these lies. Remember, the devil is a thief and he is a liar. Remember that he will he's come to steal, kill and destroy out of your life. Jesus has come to give you life. Jesus has come to give you abundant life. And so today as we uh, finish this message, today as we experience uh, the the conviction of the Holy Spirit knocking, knocking, knocking on the door of our heart. Will you come and will you sup with me? Will you come and sit down with me? Will you come and experience intimacy with you? Will you draw near? Will you allow me to smash and break the strongholds of lies that have kept you distant from me all these years that have kept you at arm's length? I want to ask you to come. I want to ask you to draw near. I want to ask you today to be able to come to a place where in your own heart you've realized enough is enough, that I want more of God in my life. I want to experience the touch of Jesus Christ within my life. If I was to ask you today, where are you in proximity to Jesus? You might have known about the Lord for a long time. But really today, if you're honest with yourself, you've got to say, I don't know him. I haven't been experiencing moments of intimacy with him for a long time. My first love seems to, seems to have disappeared years ago. Today, Lord, I want, I want what Pastor James is talking about. I want this nearness. I want this close proximity to the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to be able to hear the whisper of his voice on a daily basis. I want to be able to experience the closeness of his presence washing over me, taking all the dust of Egypt off my feet, taking off me just all the stuff that I pick up in my daily walk in the world. Jesus said that you're in the world, but you're not of the world. I want to experience that type of closeness, Lord, today. You know, the power of God is here to break lies today. And I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. And I want you to bow your head in prayer today. I want you to open your heart to Jesus today. You know, the truth will always overcome lies. Jesus said, when you know the truth, when you experience the truth, when you experience him, Jesus, when you experience the closeness of him within your life, you will know and you will understand what it means to be a free man and a free woman, because the truth will set your soul free today. Can you see those barriers? Can you see today what's been hindering you? It may not have been some of the things I've shared, but today you know there are barriers, and maybe you've identified them as the words being preached today. And it's time for you to take authority over those things. You know, Jesus is the bridegroom of heaven, and he's come to prepare a bride. He's working in that bride right now, shifting us from being distant and far away to coming and drawing near. You know, there's no such thing as an intimate marriage without closeness. And the bridegroom of heaven has come to bring closeness to the bride today. I will finish with these famous words of the Apostle Paul, where the Apostle Paul actually begins to lay out uh, straight up exactly what his purpose and his mission is in life in regard to his proximity to Jesus. And he says this in Philippians 3 verse 8, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. He says, verse 10 of Philippians 3, that I may know him. Friends, that was the objective of the Apostle Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may know him, that I may experience the intimacy of a close relationship, that I may know what it's like to have drawn near to the Lord and experience the closeness of him drawing near to me. This is a shift, friends. A global shift, I believe, in the body of Christ where Jesus is saying, I'm now calling my bride to come near and draw near. I'm calling my bride to be filled with fresh oil, to have their lamps 
filled and fueled and ready for the return of the bridegroom who will come at an hour that others aren't prepared for except for those who have readied themselves. The bride has readied herself for the return of the bridegroom. So church today, I would like to pray with you. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, today I lift every dear son, every dear daughter of the Most High before you. Father, I'm, I'm mad just like you were. I'm angry like you were, Jesus, that day at the barriers that these people had erected that were stopping the people from experiencing you in the house of prayer. And today, Lord, I'm aware that there are barriers that the enemy has erected in minds and hearts. As I address, Lord, today these things that are hindering us from experiencing you. Lord, today I want to take dominion and authority over every mindset that would keep your people from being distant, from being far away from you, Lord. And in Jesus' name, I exercise dominion and authority, Lord, over every spirit that would tell somebody that's watching this, that's listening to this today. Would it tell them that they are not good enough, that they'll never be able to come near to God and experience his intimacy? I break the power of that lie in the name of Jesus today. I rebuke you, Satan, and you lying spirit. I take dominion and authority over you today in the precious name of Jesus. And I release the truth of God's word that, that God loves us, that God's called us to himself, that he said, if you will draw near to me, I will draw near to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus today, Lord, we now take dominion over these barriers, these hindrances, and we shift them to one side. Lord, we pray that we would that, that we would face these lies, that we would trace these lies, that we would replace these lies, God, and we would replace them with the truth of your word that says you've made a way for us to experience intimacy with you. You've made a way for us to climb the mountain of the Lord and experience your presence in a new way. Lord, today, we take delight that we can now wait upon the Lord, that our strength will be renewed. Lord, I'm praying this week for the mighty touch of God upon every heart and every life to experience a touch, a moment of intimacy in your presence that can be life changing. So Jesus, today you've heard the cry of their hearts. And I pray now that the healing of Jesus Christ would be released within their lives to the glory of your name, Father. I give you praise and I give you glory in Jesus' mighty great name. Amen. Saints, be released. May you break through these barriers this week. I pray a brand new level of intimacy over your life in the precious name of Jesus Christ. God bless you.